Grateful to be here in Mana Bible Baptist Church as we gather today. We, this week, celebrated a very important uh, holiday. Um, what, it's a July the 4th, and we call it Independence Day, Independence Day. And for those of you who are historians and know, know our history, um, the United States of America indeed is not, uh, we, we, we didn't just appear out of a vacuum. We, um, as a nation, were one, one, one time, we were a colony yes, that uh, belonged to Great Britain. Yes, and one day, the colonists got tired of the tyranny, the tyranny of the British government. Um, a number of things that were going on. One in particular was that, it, was that they were being heavily taxed. In fact, they, were, uh, they, they called it taxation without representation. They were, Britain was taking their money. And here, here we've got a huge pond between the United States of America and, and Great Britain, the Atlantic Ocean. But Great Britain, the king, found a way to send his army to America to extract from its people money and taxation that was burdensome. And uh, it, it was tyranny. It was just rule by force. And then the colonies got tired of it. And I think the one thing that, that finally ignited a storm the revolution, as it were, was the, what's called the Boston Tea Party. And uh, the, these men, I think well, just a group of men, got together, went on the ships that were sent from England, and threw the tea, the boxes of tea, into the, into the, into the rivers, into the waters. And that ignited the, led to the revolution. And... Um, as a result of that, and thank the Lord that we won that, that battle, that we won that, that revolutionary war where we re revolted against the rule of tyranny over this colony. And now we are the United States of America. Now we enjoy independence. We are, as it were, free. And we don't mind declaring it. So every July 4th, um, the, the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Um, we, you, you know, you know the, the most famous lines in the Declaration. The Declaration, see, we, we declared to Britain and the world that we as a nation, we're free. We're free men. We're no longer under the tyranny and the rule, the dominion of Great Britain. And these are uh, some of the words that, that you're familiar with. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men were created equal and were endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. What are they? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What a, what a powerful expression of independence. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness wherein they weren't able to pursue happiness. They didn't have a sense of liberty. They didn't have a sense of life um, under the domain and the tyranny of, of Great Britain. But once they declared it, they were willing to fight for it. And the, the powerful implications, again, of, of independence are expressed in what Jesus has done for us as well. He has given us a tremendous sense of Independence, what? Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I would suggest to you that our happiness is not derived from pursuing happiness apart from God. You'll not know happiness if you're seeking it apart and without God. But true happiness is, is the pursuit of God. And in fact, if, if you really want to be happy, yes. learn to be holy. You, you, won't, you, you, don't, you don't know happiness until you're holy. Yes. When you're holy, you, can, you really will know what the, the depth of, of true contentment and happiness is and what, what God has for us. Well, this independence 
is, is declared here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You knew I was going there, correct? Amen. I, I didn't want to surprise you. Um, didn't want to let you down either. So here we are once again in 1 Corinthians 15. And, and here in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul states this. And, and now, now take with you the, the thinking, this idea of independence into this text. We're not, we're not trying to cast on this, this passage a meaning that's not there, but I want you to see if it is there. See if you sense this idea of independence coming out of the text. Paul says, but now Christ is risen from the dead, and he has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. Now, if you missed it, I, I want to uh, clarify for you that when the text says, by man came death, I want you to see in the text, because it's there, but what's, what's there in death is tyranny. It's tyranny. That death has a tyrannical, tyrannical rule and dominion over Adam's descendants. But independence, look at the text, by man also came the resurrection. What is the resurrection? Hallelujah. That's independence from what? Freedom from what? From death. And so we have independence in Christ and he has set us free. The scripture says he whom the son sets free is what? Free indeed. And for that purpose, he came to make us free. And, and for the next few moments, I want to share with you um, three, three points. And I may not be able to get through all of them, but three, three very important points relative to this independence that Jesus Christ has won for us that Christ has set us free from the tyranny of sin's penalty. The penalty of sin. Christ has freed us from the tyranny of that penalty. Two, Christ is currently setting us free from the tyranny of sin's power. The power of sin in our life. And number three, Christ will set us free from the tyranny of sin's presence, that one day we will know total, absolute freedom from sin. Right now we have been freed from the penalty of sin. For those of us who are in Christ and not still in Adam, those of us who are in Christ are free, independent from the penalty of eternal death. That's the wages of sin, according to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 6, verse 23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Christ has set us free. Death is tyrannical. It's mean. It um, has no compassion, no sensitivity. And Christ delivered us. I want to take you to this passage here in Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Beautiful text where, where um, in fact, it's a um, cousin to the passage we just read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man... Sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. For until the law was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. In those verses, I see three references to death. One, that death entered. Death entered the world. 
death spread to all men. And then in verse 14, death reigned. Death entered, death spread, and death reigned. And, and when I think about it, it it's comparable to this, this idea. And I get the idea when, when I'm reading this verse. It says death entered the world through sin. And thus it spread to all men because of sin. It, it reminds me of, of a, a viral infection. Viral infections are, are, um, are common and they are contagious. And so when the scripture says death spread, I, I get the sense that this type of viral contagion, death, had a pandemic effect that everybody, everybody, all were dying. And until Christ comes along to, to free us from this, this uh, hideous disease, death entered the world through one man and it spread to all men because all have sinned and death reigned. See, that's, that's tyranny. And we right now are experiencing part of the tyranny of death by way of its, its, the symptoms of, of this viral infection. And epidemiologists, in fact, they, they call um, the viral contagion, those, those people that carry the disease, they, they call them vector agents. That, that the one who passes the disease to another person often not even aware that they're carrying it. But epidemiologists, they call that, that person the vector agent. And right now, right now, um, in, in, in a way, just taking that application, I mean, that illustration, that uh, Adam was the vector agent who spread that, that viral contagion to his descendants. And we continue, we are vector agents now. And, and um, we, we offend one another. We hurt one another. We sin against one. See, that, that's because we are what? We, we have within us the, the vestiges of, of being in Adam. And, and so we become vector agents. Well, well this, this whole idea, again, illustrates for us that Adam, as, as the, the head of the race, caused all of us to become accessories. Now I want to borrow a metaphor from, from last week that we became accessories to his crime. Um, and and it's, it's difficult to, to um, excuse ourselves from that. One, because the way God views it, God views Adam as being the progenitor or the head, the representative of his descendants. And so whatever Adam is, is what we are. And, and God sees us just as guilty as Adam, as if, as if we were there. And, and I, you know, I saw this, this principle, and I, I want to um, challenge you here, that this, see, this is the way God um, has, has set up headship. Headship represents, that, that's what heads are, heads represent. Think with me, think with me. God said, God said to the nation of Israel, he said, I am a jealous God. Get it? I, I'm jealous. And, and by the way, it's not a sin to be jealous. It is not a sin. Because if it were a sin to be jealous, then I guess God is the biggest sinner there is. But God, see, what, what the, we, we confuse being envious with being jealous. God is jealous because he does own us. He is jealous over what belongs to him. And he says to his people, I'm a jealous God without apology. And he says, I want, want you to know this. You shall have no other gods before me. And by the way, if you do put any gods before me, anything, if you put anything, don't, don't care if it's you, your time, your money, people, false gods, whatever they are, if you put them before me, God said in, 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 in Exodus, and he said in other passages, in fact, he said this. He says, I will visit the iniquity of the father upon the children down to the third and fourth generation. And so you might say, well, you know what? I didn't do anything. 
Well, you see, this is the way God tabulates. The way God reckons, the way God logically handles this issue is that the father represents his descendants. And so, in fact, you, you, you can read this in Exodus chapter 34, verse 7. You'll see this theme where God is visiting the, the iniquity of the father upon the children. Numbers chapter 14, verse 18. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 9. God holds the father responsible. And then visits his sin upon his children. And here we are, the descendants of Adam. And, and as a result of that, this death, this pandemic has spread to all of us. And to, to all of us. So now all of us are sinners. All of us are vector. All of us, forgive me, all of us were sinners. Lost in, in Adam. Um, but all of us have, have at one time or another become vector agents. We've spread it. We've spread it. We've spread it. And if you want to know if, if you've spread it, have children. And, and as soon as they come out of the womb, they're, they're what? Crying. They're crying. From, and, and the scripture said that from the womb that we're, we're sinners. Just, just watch the child. Watch the child. The child thinks of nothing but himself or herself. That, that's Adam. That's Adam. That's Adam. And, and that's us. And, and, and if you don't train that child not to think about himself and herself, they will perpetuate the, the selfishness. And the egocentric uh, thinking that, that Adam perpetuated. We're, we're vector agents. We're vector agents. We communicate this, this contagion right down to our, our children. And, and so all of us are responsible. I, I want to say here that um, Adam is, was, or rather, our head. Those of us who are now in Christ. Adam one time was our head. And because he was our head... Um, we we um, have to take full responsibility, not blame Adam, but take full responsibility for our own sin. Amen. He was our head. God has uh, made provision, however, in that he has what set us free from the tyranny. See, being in Adam, God is going to punish and has punished sin in Jesus Christ. Yes. He paid the penalty. Now, now there's a huge uh, chasm between some who think that Christ died only for the saved. Huge chasm. And those who feel in, uh, that uh, Christ died for all that he provided in his death, the solution, the penalty, paid the penalty for all sin. I, I want you to know that when I read the scripture, that's, that's what I see. I see that the, the, the largesse of God was not limited to just a few, Amen. but that to all, that the same way that this, this death spread to all, God offers to all a remedy for that pandemic Amen. spread to all men. And, 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 and on the one hand, let, let me say to those of you who are struggling with, with uh, being held accountable for what Adam did, well, it, it's tough to to reject Adam's headship and then want to partake of Christ's headship. See, if we're guilty in Adam, then, then or rather, let me put it this way, if we want to be independent and free from what Adam has, has dealt in Jesus, then we, we need to accept the reality that, that uh, we're just as guilty as Adam. Just as guilty. We, we can't have Christ's provision as our head without accepting the reality that Adam one day was our head. Both, both are, are work in tandem there. That Christ has delivered us from the penalty of sin. So what, what, what do we teach here? We teach here at Manna Bible that we, we believe that there is, as Romans 8 1 says, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That we, we, we will never know condemnation. God the Father Will, will never condemn us. He, he will never, never, ever send a child of his to hell. And it's not because we're perfect. It's not because we're going to do everything that we were supposed to do. We still fail God in so many ways. But the idea is, is that 
in Christ, we have a perfect sacrifice that he died. The father punished the son for every sin that I've ever committed, every sin that I will ever commit. Hallelujah. Was punished in Jesus Christ. So the penalty was satisfied in Jesus Christ. Fully paid. Amen. And, and so I'm independent. I'm free from that, the, the specter, the, the haunting of, of that, my past. I'm free from that. Now, there are folk who want to remind me <laughs> about my, but I want you to know I'm, I'm free. Yes. Well, I'm free because I, I remember, I remember the text that the scripture says here that, that in Christ, that in Christ, we are, we're free from condemnation. So I, I, I don't, I don't want to dredge up that which God has dealt with. It insults what he did in Jesus Christ. It, it minimizes the value of what he did. Now, now when, when reflections of it come, when reflections of my past and, and my, my, my junk and all of that comes, I, 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 I acknowledge, you know what, Lord, I'm so glad, so thankful for Jesus Christ. And, and you know what, I, I bask, I bask in, in, in the rays of his grace that, that, are, that are so favorable upon me in Jesus Christ. I, I, I just, I just, just, just like being out in that sun yesterday, the temperature was what, o, o, over 101, and all I did was stand there, the heat just, just, just baked me, and, and I got wet, just sweating in the shade. Yes, sir. Well, I, I, I'm basking in, in the heat and the intensity of the grace and the mercy of God in Jesus Christ. And I, I, I enjoy the independence and the freedom from the penalty. I'm not haunted by that. I'm not afraid to stand in the presence of God. Because I know I have an advocate who stood for me. Who went before me. I'm not afraid of what he's going to pull up on the screen. I'm not afraid of what he'll refer to. Because I know what's there. Covered by the blood. I know that. So I'm not afraid of condemnation. When I see my father in heaven. When I see him, I, I'm not afraid that he's going to say, whoops, you know, you, you went over the limit here, dude. I'm not afraid of that. What, 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 what I am seriously concerned about is that when I see my father, yeah. he's going to run down to me. Dave, you, you blew it here, dude. What, what, what went on? So he's going, he's going to try and, 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 and show me those, those areas where I failed him, not unto condemnation. But unto cleansing, full cleansing and recognizing and ultimately recognizing the kind of grace that he has been so abundantly free to give me in Jesus Christ. I, I tell you, this, this idea of being free from the penalty of sin, some of you today are carrying around the, 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 the debt, the weight, the burden of your sin. And it's going to weigh you down. It's going it's to it's depress you. It's going to cause you to fear God. Christ has set us free. We're independent. And, and see, that's, that's tyranny. That's tyranny. <laughs> that's tyranny. Condemnation. The fear of death. Walking around. Fearful of dying. And you know what? Now, now let me say this. I'm, I'm honestly, honest to God. Lord knows I'm telling the truth. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm afraid of the way I die. I just don't want to get hit by a train. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I... It, it concerns me, so I look both ways. It's, it's the way I'm going out. See, I don't want to go out like that. I, I want to go out, you know, sleeping. I, I don't want to go out jumping out of a plane and my parachute fails. So I don't parachute out of planes. I, I don't want, some, some Some people have, you know. God bless their souls. But I, 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 I just don't want to go out like that. No, no, no. I'm, I'm not afraid of death. See, he has, what, taken the sting out of it. Yes, sir. Set me free from that. Thank you, Lord. Set me free. So, yeah. so the haunting that, that one day, I know on, on one calendar, some calendar, some years from now, soon, I don't know how long, but you know what? I've come to terms with it that I, I don't have 59 more years. I don't expect that I'll be in this earth. I've come to terms with the fact that I'm passing through. 
And I'm not afraid of recogn- I'm not afraid of acknowledging that. Why? Because it's it's all right with me. It is well with my soul. He has fixed it. In Jesus Christ. Romans 8 1. I'm, there's no condemnation. So I, I, I just bask in, in, the, in the sunlight of the, the rays of the grace of God in Jesus Christ. I want you to look at this passage in, in, in Romans chapter 6. No, I'm sorry. Stay with me in verse 18. Look at 5 18. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men resulting in condemnation see that was us we were condemned in in Adam don't do you know that there's nothing nothing that you and I can speak well of in Adam Mm -hmm. nothing to commend ourselves for being in Adam there's nothing there to say Oh, I'm so glad I'm in Adam. And you know what? I honestly believe that Adam is is in the presence of God right now. But the legacy that he has left behind, the awful legacy of of, uh, descendants who have fallen and and prey to this, this viral contagion of sin and death, to have to face that um, is, is awesome. And, and so there's nothing that, that we can commend ourselves for, for being in Adam. But hallelujah. Yes, in Christ. Hallelujah. See, in Adam there's condemnation. Yes, sir. Even so, one man's righteous act, mm. the free gift, came to all men. Resulting in justification of life. Let me unpack it, that just a little bit. Come on, man. That in Adam all are condemned. All men. Do you see that? All men. And that, that, that means everybody. Every individual. There is no one who is without condemnation or was without condemnation in Adam. Anyone that still remains in Adam and that was in Adam was condemned by God. Even so, through one man. One man's righteous act, his death on the cross, the free gift came to all men. This this idea that that the I believe the Apostle Paul is expressing here is that the same way condemnation came to all men. The Lord Jesus Christ offers the free gift to all men. Thank you, Lord. And those who receive it, it results in justification of life. we find what we can't find commendable in Adam. We find, we find tons of substantive reasons why we can be commended in Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Justification of life. Amen. He has set us free from the penalty, the condemnation. I, I, I tell you, I, I don't know what, it's, what it is like, what it would, would be like to, to have a a record, a prison record. And my heart goes out to to young men that I see on the side of the road with the handcuffs and bound and walking in chains in the courtroom. It's just sad to see that. And and it speaks, it reeks of of what? Condemnation that they that they've been caught. They're criminals. They violated. And 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 I see in them my own self in Adam that I, I was a criminal condemned. Just by being in Adam. But in Jesus. Justification. The idea of concept of justification. It simply means to be made right. To be made righteous. And in Christ. What we could not do on our own. Christ does for us. He makes us righteous. What a freedom, what a liberty to be yeah. right, to be right. Do you, do you know the freedom, the liberty, the sense of joy it is to be right? You know what it feels like to be wrong. It, there is a haunting there. Oh, somebody's going to find out. Yes, sir. There is a sense of, oh, no, 
there is a sense of regret and remorse, but, but when, when, when you know you're right in God, that things are justified, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. When you know you're at peace with God, the, the horror of, of, of sin no longer becomes a tyrant over you. That's the second point I want to lead you to. Christ is not only, has not only set us free from the penalty, but he is setting us free from the tyranny of sin's power. Sin's rule over us is wicked, or was. It was wicked. Demanding. Look at Romans chapter 6. And follow with me. Romans chapter 6, beginning with verse 14. Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, I want you to know he's building off of chapter 5. And the basis for this is that inasmuch as we were dead in Adam, now we're alive in Christ. And one of the points he makes as he goes on here, he demonstrates that because we're alive in Christ... Now we have some new life. Look, look at this. Shall we continue to practice sin so that grace can abound in our life? Certainly not. In fact, in, in the text, in, in the Greek text, Paul used a double negative. Meganeto, may it never be. No, not ever. That's how absolutely abominable is the concept that Christians can freely continue to practice sin. Absolutely, may it never be so. And he asks this question, if you're thinking that you can sin and you can run your sin, your, your, your tab up, your, your, your bill up, your debt up, because grace is gonna cover it. If you think like that, Paul has a question for you, how? How shall we who die to sin? See, that's the whole point. And he, he makes the point here. Watch this. He says, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know? See, he thinks, he, he implies that people who think they can live any kind of way that they want and still be on their way to heaven, he says that they, they don't know. See, they're ignorant. They're spiritually ignorant. Don't you know that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? See, what's the point? He's saying we can't live what we used to live because when Christ died, we died with him. And he died why? He died because of sin. So how can we continue to practice it if he died because of it? See, that's the rationale of Paul. And so then in verse 4, he says, therefore, we were buried. See, not only did we die with him, we were buried with him. And through baptism into his death, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. See, what, what we died with him, we were buried with him, we were raised with him. And see, what I'm suggesting to you is that if, if you, if you um, are, are, are resistant to the notion that we don't want to accept Adam's responsibility, then you can't accept Christ's headship over you either. You can't accept the fact that he, what, is your head because he died. He's your representative. He died for you, was buried for you, and he was raised for you. And when God looks at you, he looks at you as if you died with Christ. And if you look, you look at the text, look at this, look at this. Verse 4 says, therefore, we were buried with him, with him. That the idea of with there is, is a... Synergy. In fact, the, the Greek word uh, synergeo uh, means, means together with. Um, to th this kind of energy, that there is, there is energy, that, that our, our sense of our being and the energy of, of, of Christ, we're joined together. There is a synergy that, that we, we take on when we're in Jesus Christ that we didn't have in Adam. Synergy of life, spiritual life. This oneness, we're with him in his death, with him in his burial, with him in his resurrection, raised from the dead. Hallelujah. Being in Christ sets us free from the tyranny of sin. There is absolutely no reason why believers 
should say, I just can't help it. No believer can tell the truth and say, I can't. Yes, you can. Why? Paul goes on to say, the same power that raised him from the dead is the same power that lives in you. Amen. And he says we ought to what? Walk in the newness of life. Yes, sir. That's right. Back in 1965, um, Muhammad Ali uh, fought Sonny Liston. And, and before, before the fight came about, uh, Brother Wagstaff, you'll, you'll, you'll acknowledge this. Uh, uh, before the fight came about, um, uh, Muhammad Ali taunted, taunted Sonny Liston. And, and I was, as I was reading the story, um, he taunted him in an airport. They almost got into it in an airport. Muhammad Ali was just brash, bold. Um, and one, this article, the writer of the article said, um, young, young African Americans back in the 60s were more even tempered because, uh, come on, we just said come out of what, Jim Crow? So, so we didn't, we weren't feeling ourselves. Well, this, this brash, bold Muhammad Ali stood in uh, the, the, the face of, of these guys he was going to box and would tell them when he's going to knock them out. I'm going to knock you out in the third, the fifth round. And sure enough, he does it. <laughs> told Sonny Liston, you won't last five. <laughs> Sonny Liston was, and in fact, as far as the news reports were, Sonny Liston, they thought he would pummel Muhammad Ali because he had a reputation. He was big and he was strong. In fact, Muhammad Ali called, called Sonny Liston a big ugly bear, taunting him, just taunting him. And, and see, now, now that's, that's, that's how I, I really believe he was so effective. Not only was he effective in the ring, but he was effective leading up to the fight because he got in the head yes, of his opponents. That's right. <laughs> By the time they get into the ring, now, now they're, they're like, they're whipped already in, <laughs> in their thinking. I, I can't help it. <laughs> I, I can't do any better be, be, because... They were taunted. He was, they were taunted by Muhammad Ali. Well, in, in the actual fight, he knocked, he knocked um, uh, Sonny Liston down. Muhammad Ali, and back then he was known as Cassius Clay, knocked him down. And there he was, Sonny Liston, laying on the floor looking up. And, and Muhammad Ali, Ali standing over top of him. Yes, <laughs> 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 Back in the 60s, I mean, who would have heard of a young black man acting like that? Amen. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. <laughs> but he taunted Sonny Liston. Told him, don't you get up, don't you get up. Stay down, don't you dare, don't you even think about it. <laughs> Death and sin stands over us. <laughs> Don't you even think about living. No, no, you, you can't quit that head. Don't, don't, don't. In the grave, death said, you can't. Get, you'll never get up out of that grave. They thought, death thought, that it had Jesus. Taunted him on the cross. Buried him. Sealed the tomb. Knocked him out, as it were. Knocked him down, as it were. Thought they were done with him. But three days later, the real victor. And, and now, now, now follow me here, follow me here. Jesus Christ set them up. That's exactly, they, they played into his hand. I want you to kill me. Because <laughs> I, want, I want to show you my power over death. See, had he not died, had he not died, there would never have been a demonstration that he had power over the grave, over hell, death, and the grave. But when he got up, and then, then he says to us, because I live, you can live. And because he has victory over sin, hell, and the grave, you can help it. I don't care what, 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 what's your problem. What's your problem? What's your, your habit that you just can't seem to kick? There's somebody who, who won victory for us. 
in Jesus Christ. And, and I would suggest to you that if you're a believer, don't let, don't let sin, don't let the, the vestiges of sin have a tyr tyrannical rule over your life. He has set you free. The bonds and the chains that held us are free. We're free now in Jesus. So live like free men. Stand up and tell, tell, tell if you have to, if you have to tell that sin nature to sit down. Tell it no. I'm free in Jesus Christ. Father, we're so grateful, so grateful for Jesus. So grateful for the, the freedom, the independence that is ours, the liberty. Thank you, Lord, for our future. Thank you for our hope. Thank you for our expectation, our joy in Jesus.